Hello everybody and welcome to my channel. This is Savini from South Bay, California and I welcome you today. So for people who are new to this channel, this is where we learn how to build our digital profile. And as a part of that, we've been doing this 10 week long program, which is called build your own research internship, where we learn how to strategically pick a project in applied machine learning, deep learning, AI, and then we learn how to implement the theoretical concepts and then bring them to the example. So this channel is about bridging the gap between what is pedagogical and what is a real life experiment or a real life project per se. If this is of interest to you, please like and subscribe to this channel. So for today, we will learn how the importance of batch normalization and dropout are important whenever we are trying automated segmentation algorithms, especially when we are trying to move from one type of data set in medical images to another. And next week onwards, I will be demonstrating how the these aspects of these research projects or these skill sets that we are garnering uh, during this uh, experience, we should be highlighting them in LinkedIn. I will be showing how I would highlight it as an instructor and I will also demonstrate how projects like this should be highlighted in a student profile uh, using an example. So please do join me and subscribe next week. So today, let's get started. All right, so getting back to our semantic, semantic segmentation code that we've been looking at so far, we will be looking at two different versions. Uh, again, they have different uh, set of parameters. Uh, this is the input uh, parameter that we're talking about. And we will see that how the, the different parameters in terms of the evaluation uh, uh, algorithm that I had shown in, in our last session, they actually affect uh, the, the segmentation performance. So let's look into the, the first thing, which is batch normalization. So you see the, the, the top where we actually import the model and the data. So of course, data is just how you pre-process uh, everything into the into the metrics, which then gets passed on to your your model file. So uh, and th that's what actually I, I wanted to show you. So if we typically use um, you know the original uh, file where we had no the original one actually had no batch normalization into it. So uh, like I said, it's a unit model. Uh, again, it has four layers in of, of uh, uh, convolution as well as pooling, downsampling. And then after that, there is an up pooling uh, that happens uh, afterwards. So in this case, uh, the original code does not actually have a batch normalization component to it. And so that's what, you know, the, the original one that I'm showing you. But what we actually will, will get is if you don't have batch normalization and if you don't use dropout in your uh, algorithm. So here you see there's a dropout of, of 0.5. Now what batch normalization does, and there's a, a lot of material already out there. I will link some of, uh, uh, some of the good videos that explain what batch normalization does. What it does is it takes the training data and it breaks it down into mini batches. And for these mini batches, we find the mean and the variance. And this mean and variance is then used to scale that particular mini batch. And if once you do this, once you ap apply batch normalization to your, con to your convolutional layers, you actually get better results. So let's say that you have augmented data, you know, by, by using four images at a time. But then uh, if, I'm, if I'm applying it for, for 20 epochs and I have five images per epoch, so my batch size is actually five in this case, uh, and, and that's the regularization that I'm doing. And then the other regularization that I'm that I'm looking at is dropout. So if I did not have dropout, then I will actually not be disregarding some of the training neurons because of which there is a higher chance your model might end up in overfitting. So let's quickly look at what would have happened. So I actually ran a, a, a significant number of batches and I wanted to show you what happened when I had, you know, different, uh, different uh, outcomes. So this was the batch of outcome of, of output files when I had no batch normalization and no dropout. So you see, this was your grayscale image and here your uh, blood vessels. See, of course, they're a little bit more heightened than the other images, but they are clearly not well segmented. And this is because, uh, you know, without in, in the absence of batch norm, you're really not able to get a, a unified uh, scaling uh, values for your, for your input. And so the outcome is not as 
as desired. And as well as the fact that, of course, there's some amount of overfitting, that's why it clearly does not scale to the test image. However, as soon as we, as, as we you know, put batch norm, as well as as soon as we have the dropout, we then start seeing outcomes. So this would be how the blood vessels you know, segmentation looks like once, uh, you know, the output has been thresholded. And in this case, I'm using a steady threshold of 0 0.5. So that would be the impact of batch norm and dropout. So far, so good. The next component that I wanted to share with you today was the fact that dropout doesn't always necessarily mean that you have to apply it to the training data. Sometimes you might even want to apply it to the test data. And I actually wanted to show you what happens if you do. First, how to implement this is if here uh, you see in, in the layer four and five dropout is applied of, of 0.5. So in order to ensure that the same dropout is applied for your test data as well, you just say training equals two. It's equals to true. So you do the same same for uh, the layers four and five, and this will uh, allow the same uh, probability of 0 0.5 uh, neurons in these two layers will be disregarded randomly with a probability of 0 0.5. Now, we need to understand why you would want to do something like this. So I have an example right here. So these are OCT or optical coherence tomography acquired from the CIRRUS or the Carl Zeiss system. And again, this, this is a OCT system where you have cysts uh, in, inside the subretinal layers. Now, what would you have gotten if you had just uh, applied this unit for detection of the, of the cysts? So this is image number 65. And you see, you would have gotten the cysts segmented just, just as so. However, in this case, if you had applied dropout to the to the layers, what you would get is you see this this would be one version of with the dropout. This would be another version with the dropout, and this would be another. So what you're doing in this case is you are mapping or modeling the relative amount of noise or uh, the unexplainability in these images. So introducing dropouts in test images and then seeing the relative overlap between these images that are produced uh, will help you see the extent of noise or the the amount Amount of, of toughness for uh, for segmentation in that per, uh, particular image set, and uh, this concept is used a lot for active learning. With me so far. Finally, we look at the outcomes of uh, dropout and batch normalization. Uh, again, no dropout to the test images, but just normal dropout to training images and batch normalization. So enough regularization. And uh, based off of the, the metrics and the parameters that I had explained in, in the last week's session, we like to see what is the best loss function and what are the best set of parameters for the, the drive data set. So let's take a quick look at it. So first of all, as you see in this particular case, so the, the left side images, these are the ground truth. And these, the right hand side, these are actually the detected blood vessels. Now you see, uh, again, in this case, the precision is, is about 60%. Recall is almost 80%. And uh, the F1 score is about almost close to 70%. And uh, the, the right now, the, the standard says you can go up to 80% uh, for blood vessel segmentation in this case. So about 10% increase uh, in, in F1 is possible if you are able to do a good job at data augmentation for the same data set. Now here you would see as um, if we need to analyze why the F1 score is low, you would see the finer blood vessels are actually missing, but the major blood vessels are actually detected correctly. However, there are some false positives, so such as you see here. Uh, this is the region around the optic disc, which is actually not vessel, but it gets detected as vessels, even the, the same you would see in, in here. So again, the two problems that we are seeing, there are a lot of false negatives or the smaller blood vessels are missing. And of course, there are some false positives that get detected as well. And this is considering cross entropy loss uh, as well as accuracy as your metric. Now, if I had changed my loss function to the dice loss and used the dice coefficient to be reported, we actually don't get a good outcome. And this is very important to understand that metrics and parameters actually should guide our research. So here, blindly uh, using a dice loss or dice coefficient, um, but you, you would see that for OCT images, actually do a very good job for uh, with, with dice coefficient. However, on retinal fundus images, the dice coefficient doesn't really help, or that should not be the loss function that we utilize. So this is over detection, clearly.
And finally, the, the third case, this is where I, again, the, the left hand side, this is the ground truth and right hand side, this is the, the segmentation that happens. And again, I've, I've resorted back to cross entropy loss um, and accuracy, but I've run it for 20 epochs with the batch size of five. So of course, in this case, you will see that the, again, the, the blood vessels are, are relatively thicker. There are some uh, you know, false positives that, that crop up. So now in, in this case, we have to make a decision, which are the best set of parameters that we should be you know, boiling down to for this case. Of course, the right side, you know, the, the case number three that has the most number of, of epochs, of course, the, the blood vessels, they look much thicker and, and the blood vessels are much more pronounced. However, there are significant false positives, such as the, like I said, the edge of the optic disc, or again, the, the lack of blood vessels is, you know, in, in so one has more false positives, even though this, this looks much thicker and, and well-pronounced, it has more false positives. So in this case, if we had to choose, we would actually go with the lesser number of epochs uh, with the cross entropy loss and with accuracy metric in order to come up with the best augmentation metric. Uh, now, the important thing to, to notice here is for this data set, we have used uh, for data grayscale images. So the, the colored RGB images that we had, and that's what I wanted to show you is, although the current, the actual, the training images are RGB, what we have used in order to train and to augment the data is the, uh, is, is the grayscale. And that's why we are only using a single channel, just as the cellular uh, ISB challenge uh, data set that you've seen in, in the previous uh, session. Uh, that is exactly, and, and what we use is various levels of zoom. In this case, we are zooming in up to 0 0.3. Uh, and again, you will see that these are all the, you know, sub images that are used for, for training. Uh, but the important message I wanted to leave you today with is that we have trained on grayscale and the predictions that you saw were on grayscale. Next session, we will be looking at training from RGB, from, from the colored images itself. And for the same optimization parameters and the loss function, we will see what happens if we had used RGB or the color image instead of the grayscale image. So stay tuned. See you next time.